Good morning, everyone. We'd like to thank you for joining us this Friday. It's been a couple, three, four weeks since we've had a call, so it's good to get everyone back together and get some updates. We do have Dr. Stanislaus with us today to provide a COVID update. And if you have questions during that portion or any portion of this call, if you will please send those to all panelists in the chat box, that would be fantastic. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Stanislaus. Now, good morning, everybody. It's been a while since I've talked to you guys. Um, what's new in COVID? Uh, we are seeing an uptake of COVID infection. I mean, we have a lot of um, residents or staff and residents who have tested positive to COVID, but what we are seeing is those individuals are not as sick as they had become in the past. And most of our uh, residents, or all, nearly all of our residents in our HAP centers have been uh, vaccinated as well. So I don't know if that made a difference or not. Um, the other thing is also the symptoms that we are seeing currently is a little different when people are getting COVID positive. Um, they seem to have more fever for one or two days and is followed by runny nose or some sore throat. And then by about four or five days later, it seems to subside completely, about, four, about three, four days. So it sounds more like the flu these days than what we initially saw the COVID to be in the 2020, where it was getting into people's lungs and making them very sick with pneumonia, needing ventilator. Now it seems to be lingering more in the upper respiratory tract and uh, it induces fever but then, um, then it seems to be much more self-limiting. Nevertheless, if you have individuals who are elderly, have diabetes, especially diabetes, or have immunocompromised conditions, uh, you do want to take precaution and make sure that uh, you wear a mask uh, or those individuals wear a mask if somebody in the family tests positive. You may have heard about the new uh, booster which is the um, the one that came up from updated Pfizer or Moderna booster. It's a bivalent booster, specifically looking at the Omicron uh, variant. So it's a little bit changed. It's a formula has changed a little bit than the original one. And um, the CDC does recommend that anybody who's immunocompromised or if you need a booster, because typically after about four or five months after getting uh, one of the boosters, the antibody does seem to uh, decrease with time. And so um, you may be the individuals who are immunocompromised or, or people who want to take another booster should just call the local pharmacy and see if you can get the new updated uh, Pfizer or the uh, Moderna booster. Um, uh, that's all I have from the COVID, if, unless anybody have any questions. Dr. Stanislaus, we have a question that asks, is the division still requiring the DSPs to wear masks while working? It does at this point because of uh, the recommendations from CDC for, for uh, uh, health centers or health facilities has not changed. Um, and the reason behind it is that we do have individuals who are uh, individuals in our facilities and the DD facilities who are immunocompromised and, uh, you know, and just having the orphan disability itself is a high risk situation. Um, and uh, so we still want to do the best we can to protect them. Um, so, yes, in our facilities, until uh, CDC tells us differently, we are required to follow CDC recommendation. And the CDC recommendation is if it's a nursing home or a healthcare facility, staff have to wear a uh, mask. And this is universal across all over the United States. Any other all questions? Right. I do not see any other questions in the chat box. So thank you very much for that update. Thank you. And Leslie, we'll move on to you this morning. Thanks, Heike. Good morning, everyone. I just have a few updates. The Comprehensive Community Support Partnership for Hope and MoKids Health Assessment and Coordination, the Station MD, and rate methodology waiver amendments have been approved by CMS to be effective October 1, 2022. The approved amendments are available on the Division of DD's website, and I will add the link to the chat after I give the updates. 
The approved waiver amendments added the health assessment and coordination service to the waivers approved in the appendix of K addendum. It changed the limit per individual from units to per waiver plan year, or excuse me, from units per waiver plan year to units per annual support plan year for assistive technology, environmental accessibility adaptations, home vehicle modification, specialized medical equipment, and crisis intervention services. It also updated the ABA code descriptions to more closely align with the American Medical Association 2019 CPT code descriptions for ABA services, revised waiver service rate language for updated rate methodologies, increased the community support waiver cap to 40,000 per year, and increased the unduplicated number of participants served in the comprehensive community support and also the Partnership for Hope waivers. There was an email blast for this amendment approval that went out, and we can put that in the chat as well. The Appendix K addendum request to make rate increases effective 7-1 of 2022 is pending CMS approval. The division anticipates approval in the near future, and the division will provide further guidance on rates once we receive CMS approval for those for that addendum. There is a mental health and Medicaid eligibility newsletter issue number four, and it was posted on September 9th of 2022. The newsletter includes information about mental health net eligibility during the PHE, as well as after the PHE ends, presumptive eligibility and mental health net eligibility during incarceration. And we have a link to the full newsletter because it would be helpful. It provides helpful eligibility information and it is on the DMH Medicaid and training webpage. So we will put that link in the chat as well. Oh, it looks like Heike already is putting links for me. And I'm just looking to see if we have any questions in the chat. Will the rates be retro to July 1, 2022? And, and as I discussed, um, the Appendix K addendum is pending approval which will make the rate increases effective 7-1 of 2022. Okay, those are the updates that we had. Leslie, there is one other question oh. that just came in um, with okay. regard to the email blast. Um, the question is, is this talking about the transportation rate and community networking, et cetera? And if you need additional information, just shout, and I'm sure we can get some more. Yeah, if you could give us a little bit more detail around your question, that would be great. Okay, not seeing any other questions. I'm going to hand off, unless you are, Heike. I do not see any others. Okay, I'm gonna hand off to Trisha then, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, happy Friday. Um, thanks for having me. Um, my name is Tricia Parker, and I serve as the division's community health and wellness coordinator. I'm actually filling in for Leslie DeGroat today. Um, thank you for letting me um, participate this morning and provide you with some information. The first topic um, that I want to talk about is the Enabled Dental Project. Um, the division did send out an email blast in the past, email blast in the past, um, sharing the information on the project um, in, in collaboration with the Missouri Coalition for Oral Health and support from the Missouri Developmental Disabilities Council. There is an opportunity for individuals with um, intellectual de developmental disabilities to obtain dental care in their own homes. Um, this pilot uh, dental telehealth project is currently available to serve 125 people with IDD. The services pro um, provided include x-rays, exams, cleanings, fillings, and extractions. Um, while these services may be covered through Medicaid, there is a bundle package pricing for preventative services and reduced treatment fee schedules. If you're interested in participating, a consent form will need to be completed and submitted. 
for um, more information, please go to the link that is in the chat. Um, did you? Yep, Hike has dropped it in the chat. Um, that link will take you to the original email blast and have the consent. And that email blast, that original email blast, will have the consent form and an informational flyer link to it. Um, if a county served is not on the list, you may still reach out. Um, because there is potential to expand um, the, the pilot um, based on interest and need. So even though you may not be in that, that catchment area, um, still um, express your interest so they can look at expanding that, that pilot project. Um, the project does run through October 31st, so there's still time to sign up. Don't wait until your oral health needs become an emergency. Preventative care is so important, staying healthy as well as treating any existing oral health problems. Um, next, I would like to remind everybody of the upcoming annual oversight RM webinar that is taking place on September 29th. The topics for presentation include the health risk screening tool, HRST, and the the RN oversight's um, role within HRST, dignity of risk, teledentistry, oral health, disaster preparedness, end of life planning, and assistive technology. So we have a lot of topics. Um, please refer to the link in the chat. Um, I could, did you drop that in the chat? Yeah. Um, if not, I can drop it in the chat. Um, that will take you to the email blast that has a link um, to register for this webinar. Um, we, we look forward to sharing that information and getting together virtually as a group. It is virtual um, for um, everybody. Um, there will, it will be recorded and it will be um, also um, placed on our DMH website for review later if, if you're not able to attend. Um, my next topic is to update you on the Missouri Division of Developmental Disabilities Health Risk Screening Tool or MODD HRST process. Um, we will drop um, we will drop the link into the chat um, for the previous webinar. The recordings and transcripts are not yet posted. However, on September 12th and 13th, webinars titled Missouri Division of Developmental Disabilities Health Risk Screening Process um, were recorded for certain parties to be able to get information to make the decision on moving forward and implementing the MoDD Hearst process. Um, there are three target audiences thus far, so, and those include support coordinators, residential service providers, and day habilitation service providers. Um, <clears throat> we'll be recording webinars for the target audience of waiver participants and also for caregivers and families. Starting in October, we are going to be hosting WebEx calls to assist agencies with implementing the process. There will be four per month and are by invitation only for those agencies who have been notified by our team of wanting to move forward with the implementation of the HRST. Um, if you are interested in learning more about the MoDD HRST process, please email us at moddhrstproject at dmh.mo.gov. Um, and we can drop that in the chat as well, and we will respond to your email as soon as possible. Thank you, Heike. Um, also, don't forget to visit our MoDD HRST um, website. We will also drop that chat in the link as well. That is at https backslash dmh.mo.gov backslash dev dash disabilities backslash HRST dash project. Um, would like to thank those who are already participating in the MoDD um, HRST process and welcome others to implement during this phase of the process. We are currently um, in implementation phase one, which means that um, 
division contract to residential service providers and targeted case management agencies may initiate participation in the Mo um, Hearst process with individuals receiving division waiver services during this phase. Participation at this time will support final process enhancements prior to full statewide implementation. Um, full statewide implementation is scheduled to align with the connection go live date in calendar year 2023. And then, uh, um, and I'll respond to the chat questions um, after I get through the last thing that I want to talk about. Um, and my last topic is related, and this kind of goes along with um, Dr. Stanislaw's presentation on COVID, but it's related to staying healthy against communicable diseases, which means like illnesses that you can catch from other people, such as influenza, COVID-19, monkeypox, and tuberculosis. The Missouri Department of Health and Senior Services has a great deal of helpful information related to specific communicable diseases. We will drop that link in the chat as well. Um, prevention is key um, to staying healthy. Um, so don't forget to wash your hands often, handle and pre prepare food safely, clean and disinfect commonly used surfaces, cough and sneeze into your sleeve, don't share personal items, get vaccinated, avoid touching wild animals. Um, if you do, wash your hands <laughs> and stay at home when you are sick. And I believe um, that's all that I have prepared for you at this time. Thank you so much for having me this morning. Um, before I pass it off to, on to Holly, um, is there any questions in the chat that I need to address? There are some questions. Okay. Um, one of them, I believe this is in relationship to HERS. Um, How long should we expect as a wait time for response to the onboarding request? Um, usually it's it's pretty quick. Um, right now, Leslie and Misty Archer um, handle that. Um, and my understanding, they, they reach out pretty quickly to schedule that um, initial call, that first call with the agencies that are interested. I can I give you like a day, um, you know, two to three days, I would say would be the expectation. Okay. But I can Another to Leslie with that. Go ahead. Great. Um, another question is, is there a process for DAHAB providers to bill for their participation in the HERS process? A billing specialist, but I can take that question and take it back to um, Leslie and Kim. Okay. Um, quick scan here to see if there was anything else. I believe there was one. With regard to the dental program, um, can you share how many people have used the dental program so far? Yeah, I, you know, I don't have the exact number, but uh, I know that there's still openings for the initial 125. Um, I can, you know, get a more accurate number, but I think right now there's about 70. But that, okay. that can change from day to day. So if, if I, I, but there's still openings available for that initial 125. Perfect. All right. And I think that is our last question for you. Let me do one last quick scroll. Um, oh, it is. Um, someone says uh, in this, that um, Carrie says, I received response in the same day I sent the request email for HERS. So that's very helpful. Thank you, Carrie. And one other question, would a day have program be able to host the dental care? Um, so the dental care is um, individual specific. So if you have somebody in DAHAB that would need dental care, they would just need to fill out that consent form. And so, and I, I, and I believe, yeah, I believe that part of that is that for the telehealth, it's a telehealth project, and they do go into the to the homes to do the X-rays, exams, cleaning, filling. So if if a DAHAB provider. Um, knows of somebody that that could be discussed with um, 
the enabled dental providers on where they would provide that service, whether it be in the home or at the day hab, but I would think that the home would be more appropriate. All right, thank you so much. Oh, a little bit more. Um, I understand the individual consent, but could we serve as a location for the dental care? So could, the, the, could that be set up on site um, for those individuals is what I'm understanding the question to be. That would be a question for Enable Dental. Okay, we included that information in a link in the chat. So, and I'm happy to drop it in again here in a minute. Thank you. All right, I think that's it. And then we're going to um, pass off the next presenter, at, pass it to, Holly Rice. So, Holly, you're up. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm very excited to announce that we are going to have a standing section in this monthly Q&A call that's going to be sharing su su success stories. Wow, say that four times fast. Um, about our healthcare and assessment coordination service, assistive technology, and remote supports. So, as all you providers, individuals, families out there come across a success story that you would like to share, please let me know and I'd love to feature you during this section. So keep us in mind, shoot them my way. I'm going to drop my email in the chat box for you. It's holly.reif, R-E-I, F as in Frank, F as in Frank, at dmh.mo.gov. And we hope to have uh, individuals and families and providers on the call participating with us next month and sharing those lovely success stories. Thank you guys. Thanks, Holly. I forgot to say that and up next is Jess. Yes, it is. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. All right. Happy Friday, everybody. I just had some updates that I wanted to share. And so, first of all, if you um, were not aware, um, there was a hearing on a legislative hearing on uh, Wednesday morning. Uh, there was special session started on Wednesday, and we had um, a hearing scheduled with the House um, Appropriations Subcommittee for Health, Mental Health, and Social Services. And that hearing was regarding two different things. Um, one was Department of Social Services, but another one of the topics um, on the agenda was um, individuals with IDD who are in the hospital because of um, not being able to access a residential provider. So um, we had um, a really um, good experience at the hearing, we're able to provide um, lots of information um, regarding the current um, status of the workforce challenges in um, among our DD community providers and among um, DMH facilities as well that are causing that situation. Um, the, there were several partners from the um, hospital world um, as well that came to testify and talk about um, the individuals who were um, at their specific locations and um, just in general, of course, you know, their experiences. And, and so it really um, had a lot of great questions from that committee to understand um, the issue and um, what, um, what mechanisms there were in place currently um, to, to resolve those, those uh, challenges and then um, of course, what, what else could be done? And so just wanted to, there are a couple of news stories and articles out about that. So um, if you weren't aware, um, we did have that hearing. Um, the, the other thing I wanted to mention is, um, if you have not heard yet, we did have a um, uh, new hire here at the division. So for our Western, um, Region Assistant Division Director is Melissa Jones. Many of you may know her already. Um, she was with the division for um, many years previously in different roles. Um, most recently, though, she was serving in the capacity as the 
um, director for licensure for the whole department. So she's moving back into the Division of Developmental Disabilities as the Western Region um, ADD um, to provide oversight there. So um, we're excited to have her back on the team officially. Um, also want to do um, provide an update on value-based payment. I know Tricia um, talked during her time about um, some updates on Hearst, which is one of the um, value-based payment initiative. So if you have not gone out to the division's website to check out our value-based payment um, website page um, where you can find information about each of those initiatives and um, the uh, there's PowerPoints out there for training and frequently asked questions. Um, just wanted to remind everyone that the status of that is that it is currently under review by CMS as a waiver amendment. Um, as waiver amendments, and those are um, tentatively um, effective January 1st um, for CMS approval. So um, many of the um, the VVP initiatives were also discussed um, during the um, legislative hearing on Wednesday, because um, many of them have to do with um, workforce issues in one way or another. So um, there was discussion around um, the potential impact of those and the future of those payments. And so I encourage everyone to go check that out. I also encourage you to um, take part in the education around um, many of the, the efforts that are a part of um, the value-based payment initiatives. I know Tricia talked about Hearst, but um, there are also um, webinars and lunch, lunch and learns monthly um, on the, um, remote supports and assistive technology, which is one of our payments. And then we also have um, the uh, tiered support um, informational webinars that you can take part in and, and learn more about how to implement that process if you are an ISL provider currently. Um, so just wanted to provide that update. We will let everyone know as we, as we move along in that process with CMS. Um, as far as uh, budget, we're already, even though we're in special session and we kind of just started the budget from um, the previous year, we are already getting ready to submit the department budget requests. Those are due um, on October 1st. And so we are working to put that together and then um, there will be information available um, regarding that after that time frame. Um, and also there is um, one of the budget um, approved budget initiative um, new decision items within the um, HCBS enhanced FMAP funded item um, from FY23 was um, an administrative contract um, for the division. And it's sometimes been referred to as the provider review. Um, it, it's contract, um, but it encompasses several different pieces of administrative functions carried out by the division and um, the, uh, reflects the uh, growing uh, program and the division's um, lack of capacity to fully carry out all of the administrative functions required by CMS in order to effectively provide oversight and quality monitoring for uh, the services. So that has been posted out as a, um, request for information on OA's website. And so we are awaiting to hear back from that right now. Um, I believe that is all of the updates that I have, but I think there is, um, I think Dr. Trevetti joined us. So I would invite him to come on and speak as well. If you want to, no pressure. And I'm making sure we don't have any questions just while he may have just, Dr. Trevetti, you may have just been listening in um, to see. Sorry, I was muted. For you. Can, you, can you hear me? Sorry. Yeah, we can hear you now. Having trouble connecting here. Hold on one second. 
We can hear you fine. We can't see you, but uh, it's a requirement in this world. You're not missing anything. Uh, go ahead. Can you repeat the question? I was just simply inviting you to share any updates that you had or any information since you were on the call. Um, but oh, I'm sorry. No, I'm no, sorry. no, no, nothing. Uh, I do know that um, I, I heard earlier about the, the waiver, uh, the full waiver, uh, but by CMS was accepted. And then I also know that we discussed about um, discussing stories that uh, are positive about using the services. And we have several from provider agencies, so I'm happy to share those. But in general, I just really want to let people know that we continue to to really get a lot of traction from the people that use our solution. And um, Jess knows this, that because of the success in Missouri and, and, and all the great work that you guys have been doing, we're doing, we're hoping to expand in other states and people are really copying what uh, the state of Missouri is doing. Um, but uh, outside of that, just to remind people that we are there as a resource for anything and everything. It doesn't have to be an urgent issue. It could be just like a refill and a question. And we do get a lot of those. So, um, but uh, other than that, nothing else. So, sorry. Thanks. No, I appreciate you coming on um, and, and sharing that. Yes, we have had um, conversations, good conversations with Montana and uh, New Mexico. Yes, New Mexico or Arizona. I don't know why I'm confusing the two. Two very different <laughs> states, um, even though they're next to each other as they work to implement um, the great services of Station MD to their population as well. So, um, Heka, I know that you, um, there's a question um, related to the um, value-based payment for the DSP level training. So I will let you take that since that is, you are the subject matter expert in that area. So yeah, the question was, is Relias corrected to connect providers, I'm not sure if it should be corrected or contact, to connect providers Relias portal for the DSP level training VVP initiative? So um, I'm not 100% sure I understand the question. However, what I will tell you is this. Um, if you're saying that you currently have a Relias portal and you're needing to make sure that you have that DSP training plan in your portal, um, yes, we can arrange for that. It would probably be more helpful if you and I had a spoken conversation so I can help walk through what your questions um, are and anything that I can help with. So um, I'm going to put my email in the chat box and then you can email me directly and we can find a time to talk. Thanks, Ika. I'm also um, posting a link in here as well. There is um, a guide for um, providers who have their own Relias portal um, to assign the um, DSP learning path. Um, but if it if it goes beyond the technicality of that, I would reach directly out to Heike, but that is out as a resource and really love getting the questions and, and having the opportunity to talk through those with everyone about the different BVP initiatives because then um, that feeds into if you have that question or that experience, another provider is as well, most likely. So we are um, updating the FAQ document um, to, to reflect that. Um, every time we get a, an, another question. Um, and so um, we have another question here um, about when is the next rate refresh meeting or update? So just um, to give some context there, um, we are in, um, a, in the, there's a five year cycle for updating our rate studies um, with CMS and we are in um, that, year um, to update for some of our services, but we are hoping to get all of our services on the same five-year cycle. So we're doing updates, um, an updated rate study for all of the services this year. And um, so we had a stakeholder meeting in um, the, the past month regarding um, the first portion of, of data that we received from our um, partner actuarial company Mercer, um, and that was regarding the wage and um, employee related expenses data. Um, and so that information is out on the website if you wanted to go check that out under previous webinars. And um, you can um, you can provide feedback. Um, 
the um, the next stakeholder uh, feedback session um, regarding the rate study will be centered around all of the other um, expenses um, that are included within the rate, um, including the um, administrative and service related costs. And so um, we will dive into that. That has not been scheduled yet, um, but we are likely to um, schedule that in my understanding for October at this point, based on where we're at. So we will send out uh, an email blast as soon as we have that ready to be scheduled. And I don't think I see any more questions, so I, got, I will turn it back to you. I don't think that we have anything else on the agenda. Wendy, um, I wasn't, I know that you're on. I wasn't sure if you had anything to update on or not. May have put her on the spot as well. So if not, we'll call that a wrap on this. And as I mentioned, if you have any questions um, regarding that DSP training plan, my email is in the chat box. Um, and Jess, did you have anything to finish with? Are we good? I just want to tell everybody to have a great weekend. Um, enjoy the somewhat fall weather until we get our heat wave next week. So back to summer. <laughs> Bye, everyone.